special delivery. For energy solar panel. We're gonna finally make this thing properly off grid. Well guys, here with uh, Kevin from Modern Self Reliance. Don is on his way over. He's gonna give us, uh, well, us, we, a hand. I've got a couple adventures on the go, a couple of projects on the go. Kevin's got a couple of projects on the go, kind of unrelated to what I'm gonna be doing. So you guys can go check him out on Modern Self Reliance. My main goal today is to get the log cabin, the sugar shack, completely off grid. So we have our sponsor today, Renergy. So we have our panels right here. We have the Lycon 5000 coming down on the next load with the tractor, but uh, obviously Kevin was fully loaded. So we, went, we need to get solar panels up here on the sun side, the south facing side of the uh, roof here, and that will get our log cabin completely off grid. I may be able to do a fish over here at the pond. The pond, as you guys know, has been stocked. And another thing that I haven't quite talked about yet is why I haven't been making so many videos recently, but hopefully I'll be able to address that in this video. We have our uh, Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's Bass Pro Shops plot set up here. We grabbed a seed on the last video that I had out here and it's coming in really good. So <laughs> look how green that is on camera. I'm not used to seeing that green because of just how, well, how cold it's been since the last time I shot a video. You see the food plot all over there is all coming in beautifully and the fish are thriving here in the pond. I'm gonna grab a bit of feed here, toss it in the pond and just show you just how lively these guys really are. Well, before I go through the whole video, <laughs> oh, the mosquitoes. Should probably clean off the lens because I think you guys deserve to be able to see clear picture just because I haven't been delivering on the videos. Here, you want to throw some? You got the little stuff in there too. That's the sinking stuff. Yes. You got the, you got them all in the shallow though. Here, sink, I'll, I'll, the sink I'll... and the floats in there. Oh. <laughs> well, that was a that was a rainbow. I figured I'd give them a spread out so they could actually, you know, not have to fight so much for their food. There, you got the whole gun. I don't know, I don't think they're lazy. I, I think they're, they're, that's the second jar. I fed them three buckets, yet, or three of these guys yesterday, so. I don't know, they seem to be doing fine. Some of you guys left comments about how we were a little bit rough with the trout, but actually the trout that we weren't rough with, that we just kind of let go, they were a little stunned and then they sank to the bottom and they turned upside down. But the ones we toss, like trout love to, they love to throw themselves up in the air and grab the feed. So actually tossing them in the water is much like they would go to spawn. And uh, because they're, they're going to spawn, they land and then they swim. So you can see we got a really good turnout from the number of fish that we put in there. There's, like I say, I don't think we lost any, but it would be hard to tell. Then sinking on the bottom and I don't think we have any turtles yet, but uh, we may by the end. And uh, so far, no, no birds, no birds of prey. I haven't seen any. I saw like a crane, like the blue cr heron. I don't know, blue thing fly. It flew away. I didn't actually see it here. I've seen a couple mallards here, but I haven't seen any, any predators per se. I think there's there's raccoons around because I think one of them actually took a dump in the sauna. But that's another story. We, we got about 50 in there, probably probably closer to 60, and uh, they're a good variety of sizes. And as you can tell. We picked a wonderful day to put the solar panels in because <laughs> the sun, the sun might not be out till later today. Look at those fish; they're happy, healthy, and uh, throughout the season we're gonna drop a water temperature gauge in there just to see how warm it gets. Uh, we will start to take some of the fish out now. We did get them either size, so it's not like we're trying to grow them. But if we reduce the population by half, uh, going into September, October, November, December, we can pull the rest of them out and then we can turn this into a skating rink. Look at them go now. And then they moved all the feed down there in the corner in the shallow spot. But uh, yeah, they're doing really awesome. And the mosquitoes are out. So I gotta get some bug spray on if I'm gonna be doing any kind of work today. We got some tadpoles already started in here so we're gonna have a whole mess of frogs i think these are maybe toads or green frogs i don't know but you can see they're pretty pretty small right now but they're just just starting to go so this pond is already starting to produce some life 
Kevin, Kevin's gonna encourage me to use bug spray. I hate using bug spray. There. Can you do it without getting it in the camera? It's refreshing. Yeah, right. Oh, that hurts. There. That's so cold. Why is it so cold? Here, do my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Eating it. There. Right, do do like my back, the back of my shirt. I should close my mouth. Okay, do the front a little bit, but not my face. There, you should be fine. I there's nothing. Look at <laughs> I got. Look how much skin I got. And there's nothing. Yeah, but they love me for some reason. Look at nothing. Oh, man, do I hate that bug spray. But check out this uh, food plot. Cabela's Bass Pro Shops, that's a sponsor to the channel too. So I'm impressed by how well it came in. Look how lush and green that is. So before it was nothing, but uh, yeah, let's go check out the trail camera, see what's going on on there. Find out if we have any visitors beyond just the normal things. Well, it's always interesting to review trail cam footage because, well, you never really know what's going on in the forest when you're not there. We'll start with the usual subjects. Of course, that being me, getting uh, the watering of the dirt out of the way. Seems kind of funny to water dirt, but if you don't water the seeds, they don't germinate. And as you would expect, there's quite a bit of activity around the pond. So we get the usual early spring risers, which are always the raccoon. They're always fun to watch, but there are so many of them that uh, they're not super interesting to me anymore. I do find it curious that they always uh, like to get on the water a little bit and look around for things. And nearly tuned soil will put up a lot of insects and worms and things that the raccoons will like to grab. And here's some venison of the sky. I think this is a crow. I do not think it's a blackbird. Um, it looks like a bigger sized crow to me. And uh, those two raccoons getting a little bit of energy, but uh, probably startled by the camera being turned on. So they got out of dodge. And uh, this guy, of course, getting his feet wet and seeing what he can find in the pond. I don't think they're a big risk to the trout in the pond, but uh, if one were to wash up dead, they would for sure grab it. They're looking for all frogs and, and snails and clams and things like that. And here's a squirrel gray squirrel We've got a healthy population of those guys making use of the new lands uh, this guy wasn't sure what it was at first because we don't happen to have a lot of the, uh, this type of animal in this area but that's actually uh, a porcupine and it doesn't look like a very quilled porcupine uh, but he's not got his quills up and this is not duplicate footage this is actually the porcupine running in the same territory twice in a row so it seems like he's maybe got a route going and are maybe working on a couple different trees. These are bark eaters, and that's pretty much all they eat. They're very much like a, a like a land-based beaver, and so they'll climb up trees instead of cutting them down, and they'll strip the bark around uh, the outside, the active part. Now this was an interesting clip. Uh, the camera obviously got tripped from the movement of the camera uh, on the tree, but uh, this is, we had a very strong winds come through over 120 kilometer an hour, plus a very strong rain. This is a wild coyote in for a visit. He's got some wet, muddy paws, but uh, when he notices the camera's on him, he's not a big fan and uh, ducks out the back door. And then coming up, we have, well, something to be worried about. This is considered a pond predator. And turns out they like small fish about half the size of their beak. But I watched some videos of Heron taking some pretty sizable fish. So this guy is going to be a concern. Now some of the interesting things I found about this Heron is that he's pretty sketched out about the trail camera. Him not wanting to go in the water and circling and rounding uh, tells me he is a little bit sketched out. But that's all the better because we don't want him in the pond eating our fish. As you can see, he tries to get out of the frame of the camera. He's really trying to figure it out. And a lot of the ca camera captures I got was him landing or exiting the pond. Because I think he likes to land on that side, but not fish on that side because of the camera. So every time I see him leave, he leaves that way, but he doesn't tend to fish that way. Now I did adjust the camera, so in future we'll be able to see if this guy actually gets onto some of our fish, because that would be a problem. Typically, herons will eat smaller fish, they'll eat reptiles, small birds even rodents and frogs but whether they'll be able to swallow some of our larger trout will be left to be seen and again i will change the camera angle so we can catch this guy potentially fishing in our pond which will be a problem 
Now, if you guys have a solution to the heron, please let me know. I'm not sure exactly what I can do with it. A catch a cook is probably off the table because I'm not going to get permission. It's a protected species and I'm not sure I'd really want to eat a heron. Probably tastes pretty fishy. But you know what? If I could, I'd probably give it a go. So if you guys have some ideas of how we can dissuade this heron from eating up all our trout, please leave that down below. As you can imagine, if this heron eats one trout per day, by the end of the summer, we won't have any trout left. And that is something that is concerning to me. Hey Bean, how's it going? Hey. How's it going, Beaner? So it looks like we have the clover starting a little bit later. So we've got a mixture of grass, which the grass obviously came out first, but then there's some other things mixed in there, which I think is the clover. So Kevin just started the tractor up. He's gonna go get the other uh, parts of the Lycan 5000 to get that sorted out. We're getting aeration from the uh, dugout dude uh, aerator here. It's working pretty good. Obviously the sun, the sun just poked out just enough to get it fired up. So it's bubbling air in there for our trout. And I don't know if you can tell, but the water's a little bit stirred up. So I don't know if we can fix that as a problem, but every time it rains, it seems to want to wash in sort of the edges. As you know, up over here, we have the on stilts uh, cube. And on top of that, of course, is the watchtower. So if I can get a deer to come into my little food plot over here, uh, I might be able to get some uh, food, venison, a lot easier come fall. That would be a pretty sweet hunt from there. So a wood-fired hot tub. We've got the song that was built a long time ago and looks like there's another project here. Well, I won't spoil that, you go check out. But you can mention them. I can mention it, it's what, what is it, a pool? Livestock Equipment Canada supplied <laughs> this, it's a stock tank pool. Oh, I was gonna, I thought you was like, we we're gonna put some fish in there. Well, so uh, there's, the, the, it's still out on whether or not you can put fish in a galvanized tank. The, the guys at Livestock Canada, they said- Really? No, well, because it's brand new. So it's still got some zinc on it and some oils. So they wanna kinda, zinc's good for humans, but apparently bad for fish. But we got them out of culverts, so I don't know. We gotta do some research. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe we'll send that over to Clark, or maybe you guys know, you can leave a comment down below. But if we could use that in the winter season, we can run some water through there and start our fish off. They're still going over here. I don't know if you can hear the splashing. And then we can uh, grow our own fry here and then just dump them there in the spring. Look at them go. It's so cool to get to add that life into a pond that had nothing before. Uh, no crawfish, crayfish, or anything like that. Uh, but we may add some later, but you can see all the vegetations around here is working really good Well, this pulled the card out because it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on I need to put it on a computer and look at a full screen like probably you guys are seeing it right now But that heron has been busy down at the pond So that might be considered a pond predator uh, I don't know if it would be ethical or wise to eradicate the pond predator But I think if you apply for a special permit you probably could because at this point if that heron is pulling fish out, it's damaging, technically damaging our livestock. But ethically speaking, I don't think you really want to go after the heron. So if there's enough light in here, well, we don't have power, so we don't have enough light. But what I'm hoping is we can uh, actually tuck it right here behind the door and it'll kind of act like a little bit of a table too. Because you can see it's got a nice top on the on it so it can disguise it a little bit. But you know what's really cool about this thing is it helps install itself. <laughs> it's gonna, we, we just walk away? Well, can we go fishing well, and it'll install itself? Well, you got, it's <laughs> it's providing the power to install itself. Okay. This is, oh, cool. I got you. I, oh, so, geez. okay, so we're, page? we're gonna use this to generate power to install it. Yes, we're gonna, we got, got batteries, we got to charge and we got our sawzall, so. So it's like battery assisted it's, power. Well, it's self-installation. I don't know if it's not like robotic. <laughs> well, or I was hoping it was just, we could just walk away. Wow. Maybe that's what Don's for. <laughs> uh, no. Everybody knows Don's does all the work on Kevin's channel, so. <laughs> all right, let's go, we're out of here. Don, have fun, Are you'll you get it. Are gonna take care of this, Don? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, I'll, good. I'll just lift this you know in what's, now. And... You know what's strangely <laughs> odd is that we're all wearing the same shirt today. Well, we're all trying to blend in. So, so we're no, all, we all look like Don. That's the, what it, we're trying to do. The mosquitoes can not know who to pick. Well, that's what you're for, Don. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that heavy. We, we don't want to move. Oh, it's 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 yeah. We, we, we lifted it into uh, yeah. Kevin's house. So, so two of us should be like one of you. You could probably put this thing on your back. I think it's only, it's a 250 pounds or so. It's a hefty battery unit. Carries lots of juice. So it's going to have lots of power. Like even with trickle charge up there, we should have no problem. We'll keep it outside here while we work and uh because we don't want to run the wires any further than we have to 
Uh, we don't need a lot of power to get this up there. Just got those solar panels going. Yeah, so it should be pretty straightforward. We have uh, the roof is a good good pitch. It's about a 45-ish, I would say. So it's got the sun pitch. So all that we have to do now is uh, do the work. Okay, now we're humming. It was doing a self-check. That's what it was doing. So now we got uh, 120 volt output. Nothing input because we don't have our solar panels hooked up yet. So we're going to have the ability to hook our our power cord up to the 20 amp outlet and then oh, we can that's input that's the input the other one's down below so the 20 amp output and then that gives us all the receptacles we need so we've got battery powdering battery as kevin said but <clears throat> now we need to get the big battery in the sky to power the big battery on the ground which will power the little battery which will then in turn do the work into perpetuity because this is uh, designed as a big unit it is a 24 7 power beast finally we're going to have our power which officially uh, de delineates it describes it as uh, off-grid you're wondering what i'm doing right Need more power housekeeping do you need to get rid of the stuff on I'm the gonna roof get, i'm gonna get all i gotta clean it up first gotta have a clean slate to, to put mount your panels you don't want a bunch of pine needles and stuff how about a broom why why when we got all the power does it work there How much do you regret doing that? Did you wish you could do that in your house? <laughs> it's perfectly clean in there now. They're flexible. And we hopefully we'll be able to... Yeah, there's got... Uh, perfect. So we've got... Uh, yeah. Three, uh, six attachment holes on each. All right, well. Here's how about, one. How about we set it? Put it up here more. Here's a cord. Is that the pack cord? Yes. Okay, so put the pack cord here. Kevin figures the best way to put this together is on the ground. I agree. So we get all four panels laid out and we can connect them with the wires and then do our layout okay one more so presumably these have a female and a male end are we allowed to say that anymore uh, they identify still right don they identify as male, male and female. female that's right so we can ask them it's yeah. like are you male or female well, we want to agree the instructions kevin no. kevin's not uh i think they just they just do it well, they, they want to, look. Uh, well, come on. They're like, they're like begging to get together. I did it. <laughs> Grew them to each other and then it screw them to what, a stud? Pallet wood. Pallet wood's fine. No, oh. let, well, strapping. Strapping and then... Do, you, you, can do, make a frame? you can do three runs on the strapping. Well, then it'll be wiggly. Why don't we make a frame? Okay, we'll frame it out. So we've just connected the two panels together, uh, male to female, all the way down in succession. And then there's a couple extra wires here at the end, and one at the other end, and those will have to go back to the battery unit. And Kevin's just grabbing some strapping. 104, 106. You think 106? 106.5 times That's 4. 106, you're right. All right, there we go. That's a pretty slick looking solar, you call that a solar array when you get more than one. It looks pretty sweet. Can we lift it? Can we get it up there? Will it, will it hold together? It should. <laughs> Anybody's guess? Two of the panels feeding solar input one and two of the panels feeding solar input two. So look at, we got wiring diagram, which is comes in the box. You got solar array one, you got six panels feeding top array and two or six panels feeding the bottom has it got load now? Don't, just, don't disconnect it. No, there's no load on it. Put, this, put the shade, put it in the shade. You do know at high noon in the middle of summer is when you get the most power. So right when the sun's directly above us. Well, it's nice to have sun all day too. That's true. But you know what? It's nice to have trees. <laughs> it's nice to have trees too. So there is a balance there. We don't want to cut the big uh, cedar trees and uh, what's that? Hemlock. Hemlock. It's a hemlock tree. 
hemlock. Kevin's so worried about diversity, he's not sure which end to go in which. I think you have to check the biology manual. Are you a biologist? Don't don't put that in there. Are you a biologist? Sparky, sparky. I guess you can do whatever you want. Lick your, that here. With, with your own parts. You can do whatever you want with your own parts. Lick that. Lick it. What, to see if there's power in there? Yeah, just lick that right there. Well, there better be power in there. There's four of them, and it's right in the direct sun. Oh, look, we got sun on the roof, too. It's like 800 watts right there. Well, check it. <laughs> Stick it in your nose. One in, one in one, one nostril, one in the other. <laughs> Maybe you'll get a good idea. And these are universal connectors. So like every new solar panel that's made today has these universal panel cords. And I think it's because somebody had a misadventure in hooking positive and negative together and it went kabooey. Male and male can't go together on the solar panel. Is it gonna, so go is it gonna break in half? No, no, go both, if you go both sides, you, you'd be able to like lift it, right? All right, grab that side there, don't know. And it won't flop apart. I don't think it's going to flop apart. It's just Which gonna... side do you want top? Uh, we want yeah, that way. The wires bottom? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, oh, I just got stuff in my eyes. Okay, hang on, hang on. Put it down. You need help? Well, I need help here. Can you step on the acrylic? Not really. Don't go any farther, Don. There, now we can. Renergy is one of the top ranking renewable energy companies globally. They have a whole range of products. Here we're featuring the Lycan 5000. Renergy produces three of the top 10 best sellers in the solar panel category on Amazon. Here we're featuring the Lycan 5000, which is a complete solution for off-gridding your cabin or for emergency power outages if you're on grid in a home. With the Lycan 5000, you're gonna get 24 seven uninterrupted power supply because you're getting it directly from the sun. The Renogy Lycan 5000 Power Box is the most powerful all-in-one energy storage system ever, specifically designed for emergencies, power outages, and for off-grid homes. Simple and easy to repair with pre-wired design, plug and play connectors, and all built-in circuit breakers. The pack is easily expanded up to 19.2 kilowatt hours with Renogy 48 volt lithium battery. You can conveniently monitor Lycon charging and discharging status in real time through our DC Home app. There's also all kinds of moisture protection into the Lycon 5000, which is design and water shedding capabilities. Lycon offers 4,400 watts of solar input capacity. When the Lycon is connected to both solar panels and AC outlets, it can charge from zero to 80% in just one hour. You can't stop disasters, but you can stop your vulnerability to disasters by equipping yourself with reliable off-grid power. So thanks for Renogy for sponsoring this video. I hope you guys would check the links down in the description to hook yourself up with some Renogy products. Look at all that sun. It's crazy bright. There we go. And it's hitting the solar panels too. See, we could we could trim that tree a little bit. Maybe take that one cedar out. One of the cedars, like, because there's a clump there, we could take one of the cedars out and maybe the, or these two small ones here and then the one over there. Get the wires all tucked away, make it nice, look nice and pretty. And uh, we've got off-grid power. Keep going. Okay, wait. Whoa. Just one, just put one wheel up here. Oh, I know. I know. So gonna fall. Yeah. Kevin's got it all. <laughs> all right, she's in. We got to make a hole. Up in the roof though still to get the wires through. It's dark in here, so we need some light. I know, we need some light. Maybe, maybe hook up some solar. It's a good spot for it though, right behind the door. So we got the wires coming off the roof here. Just right there, right there. And then we're gonna wrap them around and then and the squirrel's been up here making a mess. That's uh, part of the project for today is maybe get rid of a squirrel or two. <laughs> We've been, uh, making use of that space up there, but we can uh, feed those wires through. You got them? Yeah, wait, do it again. Yeah, I see it. All right, yeah, I see it. Want to feed as much as you got? There. Hey, lights. Want to do that again? I got it, I got it on film. Did you? Oh yeah. All right, AC. It's rolling. AC 20 amp output. 
We got our wall sconces running. You see that wall sconce, wall sconce, wall lamp. It's not dark in here and it fits perfectly nestled in the corner there. Well, there we go. We, we've, we've wired uh, all four up now. We're getting 84, 85 uh, volts and the green lights flashing charge. So that means it's working. Getting the wires nice and pretty and they're just coming out of the corner there. And then we just have to pretty the wires up on the roof with some zip ties. And uh, I, I'd say it's pretty successful. That wasn't so bad. How long was that total installation? Maybe hour, hour and a half? Yep. Well, say about an hour and a half. That's not bad for making the frame and everything and getting it all installed and having permanent power. It's a permanent power. Well guys, I brought my fishing rod, but I'm hoping not to use it. I want to use a survival tool that was given to me by a subscriber a long time ago. But the problem with this is, uh, at least here locally, it's not legal for me to use this kind of tool. It, it is a really handy survival tool that you guys should 100% have. I don't know if you guys recognize this or not, but uh, we're gonna try to rig up this fishing system. It is a self-fishing system. It is the White's Auto Fisher. It's a mechanical fisher. So for some reason in Canada, they don't allow us to use this. And I think primarily be because, well, it's automatic, you see? It works all by itself. And here in Canada, we're not allowed to uh, catch fish using the help of anything automatic. So you can see as you wind this out, it wants to wind back in. And so if you leave it on its own, it will catch a fish. It actually has a mechanism here to uh, trigger the release. And I'll show you everything about this before we get started because you may be interested to keep one of these in your pack as a really cool survival tool. Looks super vintage. Um, it all looks like it's an old style kind of thing that you might find in a museum or a, a fishing, you know, an old fisherman's tackle box that he never uses. So there's a couple of tricks you have to know if you want to try to use these. I had to look this up on YouTube myself, but I might as well let you guys know because you probably don't know. If I don't know, you probably don't know either. Uh, but uh, as you can see, when you pull out, it wants to wind up. And I've got a little bit of a lead on here, but you can actually wind this up so if you actually grab the slack here you can take more off and that gives you more of a lead not less of a lead and you can also as i said in reverse you can add the wind back up so you can take some of that slack back out so i got a small lead on there smaller lead but again it can wind all the way up so you can imagine if you hook this up onto a tree and you only have that much of a lead well after you reel your fish up it's going to maybe reel it up on the bank and in warm temperatures, and if you're not around, what's going to happen is it's going to get all full of flies, right? It's going to spoil by pulling it out of the water. Not only that, if you leave it fishing overnight, say for catfish or something like that, and you pull it up on the bank, well, a raccoon's going to come and eat it. So maybe you don't want that much of a lead, but I want to get it out in the middle of the pond, and I don't really want to have that much of a lead. And so the next thing you have to learn is once you pull out, there is a metal piece here and that will hook or latch on that little, there's a little catch right there. And uh, that basically sets it. So when the fish grabs it, I gotta get the focus back. Okay, we got it back. So once the fish pulls that little latch off, that sets the hook and it winds it up. And of course there's no fish on there, so it made a little bit of a mess. But then you can kind of set the uh, you can set the tension on there, so you can either have it like way back there if you want to catch a big fish, if you maybe have smaller fish, you have it set there. And so what's going to happen is then uh, when the fish grabs it, it's not going to have to pull so hard to get it off of the ledge. And I don't know exactly how much I need to set that for tension. Now see if I can find a worm. The thing about worms is European. They're European. Did you guys know that their worms are European? Not that they're invasive. And that's a problem. It's that, uh, well, they have actually done a great service to the, uh, to the lands around here because they've actually aerated the lands because they make holes and tunnels and they break down uh, decaying materials. You can usually find some just by flipping them over. And if you don't find something by flipping them over, then you can start to dig a little bit. There's a slug. I don't think fish really eat slugs. I know they're not really good for people to eat. Under the barrel, under the pots. 
There's one there. You guys see that one? Oh no, I broke it. That guy was stuck. There we go. And keep this guy. There's one. You don't want to rustle around too much because that'll tend to make them go down under under the soil a little bit. They t tend to make a little bit of a hot tunnel. But um, here we go. There's a big fat juicy one right here. That one's hidden right there. I got you, buddy. That's a big juicy fat earthworm. So that should be enough to catch a fish. I'm not going to do anything super special with this worm here. Kind of gob it and then thread it. I like to thread it up the hook as much as I can. All right, so we're just going to take a little hand screw here. Of course, you don't need a hand screw. A <laughs> hand screw. Not really a such thing as a hand screw, but there you go. That'll work uh, good enough. You can also, like, obviously tie it with, you know, fishing line or paracord or whatever you want so it's, it's, it's going to be up on the bank so we're going to have to kind of pay attention to this a little bit in my kind of survival ice fishing bag here i do have a set of bells so um if you get get creative you could probably rig this up somehow so that uh you know once it starts going it gets the bell going as well so now we've got to set the tension on here which means we'll pull it out as far as we want. These are, this is my favorite little thing to have around is just little number four hooks. If not, uh, something a little bit bigger to hold the worm on there. Swivels. We need a split shot for sure. Put the split shot in my pocket for after because you want it to sink. Here we go. These are the kinds of hooks I like. It's more like a worm hook. These are number four. Uh, nothing special about them. They just got a little bit of a longer shank. I find for trout you get a a much better hook set. So we'll attach that hook with a simple fisherman's knot. Split shot will just mount it uh, down maybe a foot or so. And we do obviously want the fish to swallow this completely because we're letting the auto fisher do all the work. So what I'm going to try to do is not touch it. I'm going to resist the urge to kind of rush in and set the hook or anything. I want the auto fisher to do all of the work for me. I wanna see how it performs because I don't think anybody's ever recorded one of these work. I've seen lots of people kind of leave them overnight, but I've never seen anybody just kind of let it do its work and, and uh, video the results. So that's the objective here. Always good to have in your pack extra fishing line too, because you never know when you might need it. And uh, of course you can catch all kinds of fish just with fishing line and a hook and a sinker. You can see this combined with this makes a pretty good team combined with something that size makes a pretty good survival pack you see that for fishing gear and if you really wanted to get crafty you could just make yourself a fishing rod out of a stick once it furls out we probably will get to the deepest spot now i gotta remind myself not to jump in and do anything we gotta let this auto catcher do all the work for me uh oh <laughs> well that didn't work the auto catcher went off on itself <laughs> I guess that was enough tension to make it work. All right, so the first kind of flaw I found on this auto catcher is I had to add more line on because when I threw it out, it wasn't even enough to get into the middle of the pond. Uh, the, these work really good on overhanging branches over like a river system or water system or even a lake or something like that. Climb out on top of it and let it hang from a branch. I think this is a little bit trickier to use in a pond like this or a lake. Oh, I didn't get out. I didn't get out far enough, but we'll see if that works. <laughs> see if she works. I'm pretty sure we had a bite there. Oh, so now the, the, the not exciting part is you're supposed to walk away and do something else. It's not active fishing. But active fishing costs you calories when you could be doing something else more productive. Ah, see, I can't stop myself from touching it. Oh, 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 fish. Oh, we got a set. We got a hook set. Oh, I pulled it out of its mouth. Yeah. So, okay. Now that's telling me that we probably have, we probably have to set this a little bit uh, tighter, right? Like, I mean, not tighter, but like we have to get more of it hooked up on, on the keeper here, like deeper. Right, so that means that when it, it has to use more power to trigger it. Because we actually want the trout to play with it and swallow it. All right, this is 
Attempt number two, there's a good lesson there is that you always wanna keep checking your lines to make sure that they're still active and set. So we're not that far from the bank. We're just right, right at the edge there. So maybe it, is it gonna go? Oh, it's so close. So we've got full commitment now, I think, with the trout. And we dropped it again. So he had it, but he dropped it. But that didn't go off. So maybe there's a happy medium there. Maybe we have to get it some, set someplace in between. And of course, we might have lost our worm too. That's a distinct possibility. Oh, that line is super tight now. And that trout doesn't know what's going on yet, but it's probably just down there like, what's going on? Why can't I move like I normally can? Will this hook set go off though? That fish is 100% still on. He's just sitting on the bottom with it. <laughs> He's got to walk away. Oh, what happened? Did it give up on it? <laughs> no, it hasn't given up yet. Here it goes. Where is it? Where's the hook set? Where's the hook set? Did it? <laughs> this is funny to watch. Okay, I think it's going to go now. Come on. Oh, it's way out in the middle now. <laughs> it's way out there. And this hook's not setting yet. That fish, that fish has it now. I, I'm expecting this fish to surface soon. It's way over there now. But if the fish doesn't panic, then, um, oh, oh, there, there's the hook set. It's reeling in, but I think that's it. Is it gonna go any more than that? It's keeping the tension on the line, but because of the way it's set, it can't, it can't reel in anymore. That's it. So I think, I think I got to step in now. So it's, it's, it, it, what's, what's not, <laughs> whoa, it's gonna go. It, it knows it's hooked now. Okay, I got to make sure it doesn't get wrapped up in any of the trees now. That's uh. There, we've got a branch to get into. So that's the other problem with the automatic fish feeder, fish, fish, fisher. Oh no, <laughs> and then we lost the fish. <laughs> well, I got hung up on the log there. Yeah, and then, it, and then it came off. I don't know, there's a piece of bark there, so it came off. Well, so like, you know, pros and cons with the fish feeder, fish automatic fish catcher. Oh, look at it go up. He's going up, he's going up. There we go. <laughs> Is he still on there or did he come off? So it set, it set off and it reeled up as much as it could. So I guess that I guess that fish is on there. So now we should probably set the hook a little bit. Oh, and it came off again. Oh no, it came. Oh, it's still there. It's still there. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> we got ourselves some some lunch. He swallowed it, but that's the nature of uh, of uh, using you know live bait and automatic catchers. That they're gonna swallow this really deep. So uh, we're gonna, we'll get this hook out and we'll, we'll call it a meal. So that's a success I would say for the auto fisher, but not, not a home run, that's, that's for sure. Well, as much fun as it is to fish with primitive stuff, it's a lot more funner to fish with stuff that <laughs> really works. So I've got my uh, mystery, mystery tackle box and my post fly uh, tackle box, essentially. Well, they're tackle boxes. Anyway, post fly is for fly fishing. Mr. Tackle Box is standard um, tackle. So you guys can use the links down the, and below. There's a, there's a code down there too. You guys get a discount off these. They're really cool, they come every month. So what's cool about Mystery Tackle Box and Post Fly is that you can uh, experiment with all kinds of new stuff. It's like, why would you use something that big for trout? I don't know, why not? Let's try the bazooka and see how she goes. We don't get followers after a couple more casts, we'll switch. Might be spooking them with those big splashes too. Oh yeah. I got a, a spinner here that I opened before. This will work. No follows again. These might be too picky to catch. It's riding a little high in the water column too. I don't like it that high, but here we are. It is hard to fish in these waters because by the time you fish through the strike zone, you're, you're only one or two seconds for a fish to really decide. Oh, there's a fish. Oh, that's a big one. Dude, I got a big one. Oh, that is a big fish. Oh, I should have caught this one the first time. Come on. 
Oh, I got to beach him over here. Oh, big fish. Big fish, big fish, big fish. Come on, get up there. There we go. There we go, beaching rocks. Got a big one. Oh. Whew. You got some life left in them still. How's that for a nice trout from the pond? Beauty, huh? Well, here we go. A couple of delicious rainbow trout fresh out of the pond. Doesn't get any more fresh than that. I'm going to uh, do try to save as much as I can, as always, from these fish. I'm going to debone them, and I've got a special treat we'll get into in a second. I do want to talk about the future of this channel, so you guys know kind of what to expect, where I'm at, where my head's at, and uh, we'll see kind of moving forward on this channel. And boy, are those mosquitoes bad. Thankfully, we got the cabin right here. We can do the majority of the rest of the work in here. I just got to grab a, a cutting board. Thankfully, we got lots of spare cutting boards around. So that's all deboned. I uh, cut the rib cage out of the middle here on both of the fish. So we should be able to eat them more or less uh, bone free. Not, not, not quite 100%. Hopefully you guys get a good angle on here. That'll biodegrade and turn back into all kinds of good stuff. And it's really like an, only a three ingredient kind of meal here. We got our butter. And then we got the secret ingredient for today. Secret ingredient, you guys ready for this? We got the wadobo, but not just any wadobo. This is a regular wadobo. You guys can pick this up on the website. That's always in the link down below. But this is special because it's Wooded Beardsman Maple Wadobo and uh crack this guy open we've got the seal down here on the bottom we got to get out but uh let me smell oh it's a special blend so what's different about this is it's it's all there's a lot of maple sugar in there maple sugar sugar is from maple syrup and this is uh, sadly it's not my own maple syrup that would have been hard with the food and drug administration well, they have to vet everything, so you can't just put your own stuff in there. Anyway, yeah, we're gonna use the air fryer too because I've got some fries, so we're gonna do like uh, fish and chips. Okay, so we're gonna get one trout, the other trout, and then we're gonna do our maple, a maple blend, maple, maple syrup, maple wadobo, special edition. Been talking about this for a long time. A lot of butter in there, and again, we want the butter where it belongs, and that's that's on the fish. And after that. It's just a simple matter of stuffing our trout with onion. And the onion I, is kind of disposable. I will eat some of the onion, but I won't eat, obviously, all of this onion. This is a lot of onion, like so. And then we're going to add some more wadobo, and so that's going to suck up uh, the flavor there. Okay, so there we go. We got it kind of tented, tented over top. So it'll steam and cook a little bit better. And then this is all, of course, run off the Renergy pack. We've got the induction heat. And uh, I don't really know how to do this, but we're gonna, we're gonna see, figure it out on our own. If not, we're gonna ask Kevin. But I think if we put this on, it only works with things that are um, magnetic. So if this, this cookie sheet's magnetic. Once this fish gets going, then we're gonna switch over. We'll add our, uh, our fries. We're gonna do sweet potato. Sweet potato fries and fish, fish and chips, delicious. So that Renergy pack, as you guys know, is running everything and it smells delicious in here. It smells like uh, it, it belongs in this setting. Fresh fish at the log cabin, how awesome is that? Probably pretty cooked, but I'm not gonna flip it over. I'm just gonna let that steam just like that. Smell, so, smell good? It does smell good. I, I could smell it from just outside. I was like, wow, that smells, is it, was that wadobo on there? Special. Oh. Check, check down there. Super special. Ooh, maple wadobo. Is that the is that a new flavor? It's limited edition. How come I don't get any of these? Because I only get three. Ask Zach. Where's Zach? Zach, you gotta send me some wadobo. Well, Kevin turned the air fryer on, but I don't know if we should put the uh, fries in there yet. Because the how long does it take? It, it's almost like instant. I wouldn't throw them in yet. I would wait until your fish is about five minutes away. All right.
about the hot plate. Probably should have cooked it on the fire. But anyway, we're trying this. See how she goes. Definitely a lot easier cooking. So what's cool about the Renogy pack is that it has an app that you could actually connect to it through Bluetooth and it tells you real time statistics about what it's using. So currently we're drawing a 1980 watts with the uh, induction range and the air fryer. And uh, it shows you a load amps, like 16.5 amps. It says inverter output. So it basically gives you all the information that the techie in you wants to know. So operating temperature, we're at uh, 100 degrees. Uh, yeah. So that's pretty cool. It also tells you if it's charging by solar, but it's cloudy right now, so it's not. And of course, we're also using it to power all the lights in here, otherwise it would be pretty darn dark today. It is, uh, it just started raining outside. Well, I'm gonna make two plates, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna be two plates. It's gonna be one plate of fish, <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's gonna be one plate of fries, like that. A little bit more wadobo to the top of that. So it's basically like adding more sugar. All right, let's sit. Those are cooked to perfection. I wanted to try I Like it's like the fourth time I've used the air fryer. Those are crispy on the outside, delicious on the inside. How's nope. the fish? I'm not, I'm not a fan of the uh, pot plate. Not for cooking fish. I just like it on when the, you put it on the fire, it's more um, crispy. Like the, edges, just, the edges are crunchy. That's what you want, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. Like you don't want it to be dry, that's for sure. But you also don't want it to be like sitting in the butter too much because then it's more like boiled fish. But I mean, it's boiled fish and butter. So it's not like, it's terrible. Can I suck the eyeballs out? We'll save that for later. <laughs> save that for the dessert. So Kevin's getting us a uh, fire going so we can do a fireside chat. Get, let you guys know what's going on. But he wanted me to take care of the squirrel up here. Well, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of Princess Auto and I got these uh, rat traps uh, not too long ago to be used for Red Squirrel. It's a really good survival tool that you can use and have in your pack if you want to try to catch some something easier to catch. So I'm going to use this obviously to get rid of the squirrel problem that we have and we can turn this guy into something more productive than uh, just a Red Squirrel. We can use it to maybe uh, turn into a fishing lure or something like that. I think would be pretty cool. They do use this sort of thing for map spinners. They tie on around the hook and uh, has a good action inside of the water. Uh, if I do catch a squirrel here, I'll be sure to let you guys know. So stay tuned. Now we got a smoky fire going, which is good because it'll get rid of some of the mosquitoes. Uh, Kevin thinks it's a bad year for mosquitoes. I think it's like this every year. I think Kevin just forgets more so because he's out more in the open here, whereas if I'm off on an adventure in the back 30, then uh, I definitely feel <laughs> the mosquitoes. So uh, I did owe you guys, uh, I don't know if I owe you an explanation or not, whatever. I feel like I should give you one anyway. But uh, it's, been, it's been a tough two years. As you guys know, I've had some issues with my stomach and no, it's not related to eating uh, crazy foods. I wish it was, but it's uh, sort of a, there's a family history there. Uh, my dad's on medication and my sister, my younger sister, she's only in her 30s and she's on heartburn meds now too. Um, I've been talking to her, what she's taking. Uh, I started with the medication that she was on uh, and it worked. Uh, well, I, I got prescribed medication from my doctor first. Um, it wasn't a time release one. They do have uh, proton pump inhibitors, what they're called, but they have a time release one. And what happens is, well, it worked for about two weeks and then it stopped working. But I was getting like really bloated um, I gotta knock this down before it gets too big. I was getting really bloated and um, nauseous and like to the point where I was like wanting to throw up. And then I was getting a little bit of the heartburn, not so much, mostly it kind of felt like weird, like an anxiety, but I, not anxiety, you know what I mean? So kind of like a panic attack feeling, but not a panic attack. Not, not a panic attack, it was definitely digestive. I had digestive issues my whole life. Um, so I basically have like a, a diet where I don't eat gluten, I don't eat uh, very much sugars, I don't eat uh, so drink or soda, I don't drink alcohol. So I really wasn't doing any of that stuff, no, no gluten, nothing really weird, kind of standard, you know, issue, uh, healthy diet. And so this kind of came out of nowhere two years ago, it hit me pretty hard. And um, was getting really, really bad to the point where like I was not sleeping, I was waking up in the middle of the night. and. Um, middle of the morning and I wasn't resting and I wasn't able to do any work anymore. It was just like gnawing. 
And then I have like a really bad stomach, um, burning, burning feeling, like just bur like my whole stomach was on fire. They did a, I did a scope, uh, C, uh, CT scan, CAT scan, I think it's called. We drink the solution and then they put you in the machine and um, they and they inject you with stuff and they bur uh, barium swallow. All that came negative. Like they didn't, they scoped, they didn't find anything there, nothing weird, no ulcers, um, um, no, uh, nothing up in my upper throat because my sister has uh, EOE, so that's upper esophagus. Um, so that was all, that all came up good. So I didn't have any issues with that, which was kind of weird. Um, so I figured, well, maybe the, the stomach, I mean, it had low stomach acid because it was on the proton pump inhibitors because that's really, it's a, it's a, it stops your stomach from producing the acid. I had to keep knocking this fire down before I turn on fire myself. Um, so I went off the, the antacids, the, the proton pump inhibitors for about two months. It felt pretty good. Uh, and then it came back even worse. Like after the two weeks, you know, your stomach acid kind of normalizes. Well, it came back, I got through that fine. Like whatever, the pain's fine. Um, as your body gets used to producing the stomach acid again. But then after about two months, I couldn't, I was right back to where I was before. My stomach got really bloated again. And uh, you know, I couldn't, I, I had to go back on them. So I went back on them. And then, uh, you know, for the first two weeks felt good. And then I stopped worrying. So I switched to the medication my sister was taking and that I was on for about a year. Um, but I never really resolved all of my symptoms. It made me felt like I was like I could work, uh, so, sort of, but not really. And then I get flare-ups all the time, no matter what I ate. It wasn't really related to the foods I was eating. And um, so my doctor said, "Well, double the dose." So I doubled the dose, and I was out. Like I was getting bone pain, like my hip bone was killing me. Uh, my knee was starting to kill me. Like it was like I like I felt like I was 20 years older, like an old like an old man. So I was in bed, and my hips like gnawing at me. It's like deep bone pain. So it's probably side effects of the medication. So I like, I can't do this anymore. So I went off of it again, two weeks, get the symptoms come back, the acid comes back, and then another month after that, just worse. I'm like, okay, so doc, what can I do? He's like, well, I'll give you another medication. He's like, um, it's probably not something like digestive. It's probably not a parasite or something like that, but he prescribed it to me and I didn't take it. Um, and then he gave me a different kind of med and I said, well, let's, start, let's do like half the dose instead of four times the dose because it doubled the dose originally. So I was on the 15 milligrams of PPI medication, different kind, uh, once a day. And um, better, uh, but not perfect. But now I'm to the point where I feel like good. I like, I'm not getting the side effects I was getting from the, the, the double dose. And I'm not uh, feeling the bone pain so I don't feel like an old man. So I have enough energy to actually do this stuff. And um, and then I, I saw a YouTube video about them talking about like, he's talking about how you can sometimes get the same symptoms of high acid as uh, if you have low acid. So if you have low acid, you get heartburn um, and, and those other nauseous feelings. And I'm like, okay. And they suggested that you take um, uh, apple cider vinegar. So uh, now I've been you know, I feel nauseous or I feel like I'm getting like acid reflux. I take a shot of apple cider vinegar. If you ever, if you ever tried that, it's not pleasant. Um, but so I was taking it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then like, okay, but most of the symptoms I was getting in the evenings. Um, so I stopped breakfast and, and, and lunch, like before meals, apple cider vinegar, because that's more like neutralize the acid. So you get enough acid where you're not like feeling like you got like a, a stomach full of just garbage in your, that's not digesting because your body needs a certain amount of acid to knock down the bacteria so you don't get bloated. So <laughs> it's a big concert of, of things, right? Um, and then the theory behind adding the acid is like if you have a proper amount of stomach acid, then your the sphincter in your stomach, in your uh, the upper part of your stomach closes so that the acid is not washing back up, which obviously gives you heartburn. So um, it's obviously like a, it's not everybody that suffers from low acid, but if you're on acid inhibitors, then it could be something that's contributing to why the medication you feel like is not working. So anyway, the long story short is I feel a lot better. Um, and so I've been taking a break from my channel. Um, 
And I don't know if I'll go back to doing like a video every week or like I was when, when I was really going like a video every two, like two, twice a week was a, as a hefty schedule. Um, so now of course I'm doing Kevin's channel, which kind of eats into the time that I have anyway, as far as like what I can do with my own channel. And I don't really feel like I need to go back in full steam. Um, you know, uh, there's a double edged sword with doing YouTube videos for YouTube. Um, originally I started doing YouTube videos because it was, um, I was doing, I was going out and re-exploring the outdoor, um, anyway. And then it was like, okay, well, I've kind of done this for a couple of years now. So now it's like an incentive to go out. Cause like, oh, I'm going to shoot a video and I'm also going to do something interesting and I can turn that into a really interesting video. Well, after a while, it's like, okay, it's now it's a grind and now it's work. So it's maybe not as fun to go out and do a video. And then I kind of run out of interesting things to do around here. And then along with obviously feeling sick um, is one, t one thing on top of everything. So like you go out and do these, uh, these challenges, outdoor challenges is suffering. And then I, I'm suffering already. So like, do I want to suffer on top of suffering? The answer is no, I didn't. So last year when I was still doing like those, the, the big string of survival challenges, like I was feeling not good doing them. And then on top of that, um, you know, the, 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 all the work that goes into making the video and the challenge itself. So it was like not a recipe for a good um, headspace. So I backed off on that and then I just shot videos whenever I wanted to. Probably that's what I'm gonna continue until I feel like really, really good and I got like all my energy back and maybe most of my symptoms are resolved. I kind of feel like that's coming there now uh, the vast majority of the symptoms I was feeling are gone now and I'm taking uh, probiotics on top of the and uh, the, the PPI and acid uh, medication and you know at some point I'm probably gonna go off that and see maybe it was low acid because it like I say the symptoms could be confused with one another I'll definitely shoot a video when I find something interesting to do um, but I don't think they're gonna be as like as regular as before I do want to get into the once a week schedule uh, that I was in uh, previously and I do think that that's achievable um, so I'll be working toward that as my goal and as well as keeping uh, Kevin's channel going as well so that does eat into what I'm able to do and the bigger trips I'm able to do but at some point I'll figure that out too so I do appreciate you guys sticking around I know it's been hard to watch the ASMR videos but uh, it's the only way I've been able to kind of keep my channel going and sort of have a little bit of traction because if you abandon the channel altogether YouTube doesn't like that. So I do appreciate you guys clicking on watching this one as well as all the other ones. Do check out the sponsor, uh, Renergy. It's working away now. And, uh, you know, it is obviously one way forward to keep the channel going because uh, YouTube sponsor or YouTube uh, um, videos and, um, and the money generated from them is, is not what it used to be. You really have to smash those big numbers to make a go of it. So anyway, that's a long story. But uh, I appreciate having you guys along and I'll see you guys on the next video.